go ahead and introduce Dr. White, who is an associate professor of environmental justice at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the past president and board of the board of directors of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. She teaches courses in urban ag and food systems, community food systems, and is the first African-American woman to earn tenure in the College of Agriculture Life Sciences in the history of University of Wisconsin, as well as tenure in the Gaylord Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. Her research investigates communities of color, grassroots organizations engaged in the development of sustainable community food systems as a strategy to respond to issues of hunger and food inaccessibility. Uh, welcome, Monica White. Thank you, Roger. Um, just a few things. Um, Erica, you're charged with letting me know if I talk too fast. Just sort of find a, I used to do this until the baby shark phenomena. <laughs> You'll thank me later for that earworm. I um, want to also thank you all for um, the invitation. Thank you for showing um, Chi Town love for this D Town sister. Yo, yo, all right. Uh, right, right. So I always start my work, um, my presentations, by telling the reasons that I do this work. Um, this is an image of my father, who was an educational psychologist, who also had a farm, had a garden. Um, we had um, 10 acres in um, Buckley, Michigan, and he taught me the connection between food, love, and celebration, community. And so I'm always grateful to him. This is me looking up to him virtually, literally, and figuratively. Uh, this is a fuzzy picture of my grandfather, um, Kenneth Brown. Uh, just how synchronicity sort of happens. You find out things about family that you don't realize, and they say all of writing is autobiographical. So I remember as a kid, we would go down to Eden, North Carolina, and my grandparents had a store in the front of the house. And so my, my mother would always say, don't give that baby everything. And of course, as grandparents are supposed to do, they give you everything. And so uh, my mother had some health challenges and I reached out to my aunt and I said, Aunt Barbara, can you tell me a little bit about that store in the front of granddad's house? And she said, it was called the community store. And your grandfather with nine other farmers had a cooperative and they shared a vehicle. It was after I wrote the book that I found out that my grandfather, I'm actually writing about my grandfather. I knew he was a farmer, but I didn't know he was a member of a cooperative. And so they say all of life, all of writing is autobiographical, and I truly believe that. And this is actually him in the store. So just want to say, never realize where your path will take you, and sometimes you learn more about yourself in beautiful ways. So freedom farmers, the reason I have always wanted to be a farmer is because I believe then and believe now that the farmer is the only free man we have in our race. Benjamin Carr, 1914. So, you know, you sort of hear people talk about the relationship between land, food, and freedom in a contemporary conversation, and you just kind of wonder, have there, other, have there been other times, other moments, when people have turned to agriculture as a strategy for resilience and resistance? And lo and behold, the book that we're going to be talking about actually shows the ways that I was able to find this historical precedent of looking at the relationship between food as a strategy for building community. Um, just by way of offering some additional readings, um, a, a Pig in a Garden, Fannie Lou Hamer and Freedom Farms Cooperative, um, Sisters of the Soil, Urban Art Gardening as Resistance in Detroit, Race and Food, I did with a, a graduate student of mine um, at um, Wisconsin, and A Way Out of Norway, Collective Agency and Community Resilience of Black and Latinx Farmers in Michigan, which received a re um, revise and resubmit, so we'll get that published soon. So we can talk about the civil rights movement, and often we talk and think about the civil rights movement. We can talk about the songs of the civil rights movement. We can talk about the, um, the, the um, students of the civil rights movement. We can talk about buses and boycotts of the civil rights movement. We can talk about the pastors. Um, but I don't think we often think about the farmers. What role did the farmers play in the civil rights movement, especially organizing issues such as, or conversations or spaces such as the um, Freedom Summer? Here we have farmers that are welcoming the Freedom Riders uh, who traveled to Mississippi to support the right to vote, integrating public institutions, self-determination, and as a resistance strategy. And so if you think about what it must have been for a busloads and busloads of young people to come and descend upon Mississippi, which was notorious for its 
rough politics, if you will, um, there had to be some foundation that accepted and provided for those students. Of course, it wouldn't be those who supported the status quo. And so with this in mind, we have to recognize and honor that they were farmers. That farmers were the ones who fed them. Farmers were the ones who housed them. And farmers were the ones who put their land up for um, their bail when they were arrested for organizing. And so this conversation of what role does agriculture play and what are the ways that farmers have participated in resistance I love the Mississippi Freedom, uh, Freedom uh, Liberation, um, sorry, Labor Union. And I wanted this to be the cover of my book because I wanted to show something that demonstrated farmers and organizing and politics. I didn't win this argument, but it's still something very beautiful to think about the ways that um, sharecroppers were organizing strikes. And this was some of the most active political organizing in the South after the, civil, after the right to vote. So this leads to what is the overall research question that I seek to answer. How have farmers organized in collectives and cooperatives as a strategy against racial and economic oppression? And how does agriculture particularly expand our understanding of resistance or of a social movement strategy? And so, of course, you cannot talk about agriculture without talking about Booker T. Washington. Uh, Booker T. Washington, while a complicated historical figure for us, um, really did a tremendous work for African Americans in terms of farming. Um, he did show us what black institution building looks like. As a matter of fact, the school that he started is still in existence. And what's important to recognize is that the work that he did at Tuskegee is said to have benefited over a million farmers immediately after his passing, but even more significantly since then. And I think what's important to note is that students who graduated from Tuskegee then returned to their home counties, bought land, and then established other Tuskegee-like institutions. So we can't just think about Booker T. Washington as, you know, the three things, an argument, a speech, and a school, I think we have to, we owe him the, uh, the justice of a more nuanced conversation. Of course, we know uh, Du Bois and his work and, and even the, the conflict that existed between the two. Um, if you read my book, you will hear that I'm really sort of recognizing that while Du Bois talked about the Talented Tenth, um, toward the end of his life, he really sort of walked away from that as a framework and then began to think more nuanced in terms of addressing and talking about what we need to do collectively. And it is in his work that he suggested that, yes, in fact, segregation exists, but segregation allows us an opportunity opportunity to organize such that we come out as a force, as a united force. And I do argue that his analysis of what farmers need to do really is one of the first conversations of a food systems analysis that we've seen. You can't do any of this work without honoring and respecting the work of George Washington Carver. He is the founder of sustainable agriculture and not Rodale, contrary to what many people believe. And so we talk about him, especially during Black History Month. It's the soybean, it's the peanut, but it's so much more than that. And I'm hoping that these conversations will really elevate his position. I think he was the original dumpster diver and was the reduce, recycle, reuse, because he was known to go over to Auburn University, uh, historically a predominantly white institution that had access to all kinds of resources. So he would go and sort of reuse those Bunsen burners. <coughs> Excuse me. But also, while folks of his time, contemporaries, were suggesting, go ahead and use whatever means to make something grow to your disposal, what he was saying is, no, 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 don't do that. You need this soil. And so he was talking about the swamp muck and telling us how to compost. And he was talking about how to diversify our crops and how to rotate our crops and what have you. And so I think that he deserves another listen. And of course, we leave it to the sisters to show how this is all done. Mrs. Hamer and Freedom Farm Agricultural Cooperative really was a transformative moment that I hope we will give it the honor and respect that it is due. So just for the, the academics in the room, you always want to know how did you find what you found. Um, I did primary and secondary, uh, primary archives and secondary sources. I also did semi-structured interviews with generational black farmers, food activists, and growers. So it wasn't uncommon that I would be in the archives all day, and then in whatever area I was, I would call somebody, particularly um, Mr. Burkett, Mr. Ben Burkett, who's fourth generation farmer in Mississippi, and we would have these conversations. We'd have dinner, and I would say, okay, Mr. B, tell me how this, where, who, and so undoubtedly this is a collective project that I have farmers to thank for um, the work, but also for assisting me in pulling this all together. 
So I went through several or archives and just did a, a collection of all the organizations that I saw that were cooperatives or collectives that were co uh, um, of black farmers, right? And so what I did was I created this graph where I said, okay, so what did they do? And every time they did something, I then would put it down and then I would write it down and then I would categorize it. I would thematically just sort of understand, put it in a category. And then as an academic, we have to then explain it. We have to come up with a theoretical framework to explain how these organizations function. And with this in mind, came up with a theoretical framework called collective agency and community resilience. So um, collective agency and community resilience, they, uh, there are three strategies, commons as praxis, prefigurative politics, economic autonomy and independence. So these are the ways that various organizations, cooperatives and collectives have functioned. Now for the interests of both tenure and the book, uh, my friend Sunayata Chajua, who teaches at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, I said, you know, the first title was 1880 to 2010. He's like, Mo, you can't do that. You'll never finish. So then I had to narrow it down. I still use the same sort of data to sort of articulate the framework, but then concentrated on organizations that were active in the late 1960s. So the theoretical framework, um, collective agency, we tend to think about agency as a psychological construct. Um, and so what is it that leads one person to make a change or to make the decision that they want to change socially, politically, and economically? But I thought that there's something very different when we see communities, not unlike the organizations that you represent, that come together to bring about or demand a change socially, economically, politically, in terms of accessing nutrient-rich food. So for me, the idea of collective agency, a social actors collectively, ability to uh, create and act behavioral options necessary to uh, affect their political future. Now, resilience, when we think about resilience, we often think about resilience post a catastrophic event. Something awful happens, <clears throat> excuse me, and we talk and explain and celebrate the ways that we come together to support each other. I think there's another important component to understanding resilience. It's not enough to just say, here's how wonderful we are after this event has happened. I think we have to then turn around and say, what are the vulnerabilities that certain communities experience to respond to that as well? So it's great that people come back, rise up, but I also think the other part of that conversation is what makes certain communities more vulnerable than others. So for me, community resilience, ways to adjust, withstand, and absorb disturbance, and to re reorganize while undergoing change, emphasizing structural approaches um, and community engagement, in, in, including types of indigenous knowledge, emotional experiences, intra interracial exchanges that communities need in order to adapt to unforeseen conditions. So the first strategy, commons as praxis. Here I believe that you can watch these organizations, collectives and cooperatives, and the reason that I say cooperatives is because some were formally organized as cooperatives, adhering to the, 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 the mandates of Rockshaw's principles, but there were others that were collectives that still had similar kinds of ways that they function. So commons as praxis is one strategy that emphasizes community well-being and wellness for the benefit of all. How do we make decisions about how we will use land and how we will use water and what have those act, um, access to those things that we share. This is a shared ideology. We're thinking about collective, cooperative. We're also making community decisions around these shared spaces and resources. And I think it moves us for thinking about a situation or condition that is oppressive to one that is liberatory. Prefigurative politics, not my word. It is acting as if, right? Prefigurative politics, acting as if. It's the construction of alternative political systems that are democratic and include processes of self-reflection. And so for many of the black farmers who were in the 1960s, they couldn't participate in electoral politics lest they would be both fired and evicted from their land. And so the organizations that they created, they acted as if. So there was a political education, there was a right to vote, there was one person, to one vote, and organizing in these these ways allowed people to exercise their political voice and would then allow them to use those demands in other contexts. So we're talking about the exclusion of political process, creating free spaces for conversation, self-management, and the importance of political education. And economic autonomy. I think it's important to recognize that um, within a political system, autonomy may be difficult, if not impossible, but that doesn't mean that we don't stop working toward it. And so it's an alternative system of resource exchange within the community with direct benefits for its members. And so Baba Malik Yakini from the Detroit Black Community Re um, 
Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, actually literally taught me so much about the language of food justice and food sovereignty. And one of the conversations we often have is resource regeneration versus resource extraction. So if we're talking about resource regeneration, collectives and cooperatives allow us to pass the money around, pass the money around, pass the money around. Resource extraction would be, I go into you, I pay, that money then goes outside of my community. And so this new way of functioning requires us to think about the ways to create different means to make sure that dollar or whatever currency goes around in more ways than one. <clears throat> it could be in terms of sweat equity, it could be in, for D-Town, we have D-Town dollars and what have you. Alternative economies and currencies such as bartering, one hour's labor for one hour's labor. Um, means that we sort of respect each other no matter what those jobs are, right? So somebody may say, how do we value a, a, public, a plumber versus a professor? I tell you, if it's three o'clock in the morning and there's something gurgling in your basement, you don't wanna call me, I can't do nothing for you, but that work is as important, right? And so how do we honor an hour's labor for an hour's worth of labor? And also collective and community. So I just wanna show you that there's a historical precedent for the work that you all are doing, that although we like to think what we're doing is new, there are historical anchors in this work, and so I'm hoping that this trip down history will fortify and support your ideas, give you new ideas, but also just sort of give you a trajectory just to sort of see, okay, so we are the current um, beneficiaries of the legacy of black folks doing this work. What does it look like? What have they done? And what is it our job to do? So uh, one, one thing we know is that the students at Tuskegee did everything from building furniture to building buildings to making shoes to growing food that was sold in, uh, that was dispersed in the cafeteria, but also feeding the neighborhood. And so their bricks were so incredibly popular. So many people bought the bricks that were built or made by the students and they so clean they're doing it in suits, y'all. I love this picture because it demonstrates Booker T, I'm sorry, George Washington Carver and Booker T. Washington's sort of vision. So when Booker T. Washington was thinking about designing Tuskegee, what he did was before any bricks were laid or any classes were taught, he went through the neighborhood and did a very thorough rural ethnographic study of the community and he describes what he saw. Now, yes, some of the things he described were really problematic. I feel like he critiqued people who were victims of a structure without critiquing the structure itself. That was our battle, we fought often. But, you know, and just sort of looking at and thinking about the ways that he was able to cross barriers, instead of saying, sure, you have tuition, if you can make it here, come on, I'll teach you. With George Washington Carver, they created the movable school. Some people call it the Jessup Wagon. There are many different names. Uh, Jessup was a philanthropist. But I just think it's really incredible that we think about the ways that we cross these barriers, right? So we don't just have education in schools, but we also make sure that we meet people where we are, and that's a part of that, um, that legacy. Here is a pig uh, being inoculated. These are some of the actual pictures from the book. Not all of them are. Um, but they did all kinds of, on the movable school, they had the top of the line sort of techniques in animal care and agriculture and even health care. And it just traveled throughout the several con uh, counties in Alabama. I love this picture. This is of the Tuskegee uh, Farmers Institute. And um, I don't think that even the archivists recognize George Washington Carver in the top left corner with a misfit jacket and just looking so humble and so earnest. And he just, he's one of those people that you meet and you're just like, dang, if I just had 15 minutes to talk to him, I just wanna just really just have a chance to benefit from his brilliance. So if we think about what these institutions did and these people did, I think it's also important to recognize what are the legacies of what they did, especially for farmers. And so in terms of political uh, prefigurative politics, these are the farmers of the Mechanics and Farmers Bank. So once you grew, you sold what you grew, then you needed the black institutions to support the causes for which you were, right? And to make, make sure that if in fact we were discriminated against by other banks, that we created the banking institutions that would meet our needs. And so that think that this part is important. There is probably no subject more important than the study of food. Isn't that beautiful? And so he wanted to make sure that farmers, whatever he shared, whatever he learned, whatever experiments he did, he wanted to convey that to people. This is a, a pamphlet that he did, Help for Hard Times. Do we need it today or what, y'all? 
in these writings, he had a calendar of when to grow. He had how to create niche markets, um, how to do preserves or what he called fruit leather, um, farm byproducts like wood, um, quilts, farm tools, animals, everything in order to be self-supporting and self-reliant. He also published these articles, Three Delicious Meals Every Day for the Farmer. He had recipes, he had images, he had all kinds of, just really recipes that were seasonal, they were affordable, and they were also organic. There exists today a chance for the Negroes to organize a cooperative state within their own group, letting Negro farmers feed Negro artisans, and Negro technicians uh, guide Negro home industries, and Negro thinkers plan this integration of cooperation, while Negro artists dramatize and beautify the, str the struggle. Economic independence can be reached. To doubt that it is possible is to doubt the essential humanity and quality of the brains of the American Negro. That sounds like a food systems analysis, right? From this part to this part to this part to this part in a way that links the whole entire black community. But he wasn't done then, y'all. We not only build and finance Negro churches, we furnish a considerable part of the funds for our segregated schools. We furnish most of our own professional services in medicine, pharmacy, dentistry, law. We furnish part of our own food, our clothes, home building, repairing, many retail services. We furnish books and newspapers, endless personal services like those of barbers, beauty shop keepers, hotels and restaurants. And with this in mind, why can't we create cooperatives that meet the needs of folks in a way that is economically autonomous such that we can come out, can compete and take care of ourselves, but also interact with others. So um, Mrs. Hamer um, was not to be dismissed. Her brilliance has to be also elevated. Down in Mississippi, they're killing Negroes of all ages on the installment plan through starvation. If you're a Negro and vote, if you persist in dreams of black power to win some measure of freedom in white controlled counties, you go hungry. There is a way to fight against this nonviolent weapon of white officialdom, where a couple of years ago, white people were shooting at Negroes trying to register. Now they say, go ahead and register, then you'll starve. So here, this quote captures how Mrs. Hamer an analyzes access to food as a strategy or weapon of oppression, right? Nobody told us we have to move in Mississippi. Nobody tells you when we're not wanted. And when you're starving, you know. We're, um, yeah, that, that's the second part of that quote. So I think it's important for us to just see how she's saying food and hunger as oppressive, and then uses that logic, food as a strategy of liberation and freedom, which is what she used to then build Freedom Farm here, this is Mrs. Hamer in a coat and scarf at the Freedom Farm, um, the co-op. What they did was all the crops that they grew, 10% would automatically go into the cooperative that would be shared with those who weren't able to work the field. Um, and then other folks could either work for their portion or um, come in and purchase it, healthy, nutritious food at an affordable rate. And so I think that it's important um, to recognize how powerful Freedom Farm was. Excuse me. In addition to the co-op, they had a pig bank where you would get a pregnant pig, you would nurture it to have the babies. Once the babies, once they have the babies, then two of those go back to the bank and those then would be distributed to others. It was the first heifer international project and it is a beautiful example of micro lending in ways that were really important. And some people say, why the pig? People call the pig, um, um, like uh, an investment that in two years it would maximize its profit and then be used either for meat or um, to have more babies. Um, they had a housing development, which you'll see some pictures. They did education and re-education programs. They had a business development program called Afro Boutique, all right, holla. A sewing cooperative, laundromat, disaster relief, transportation, and they also had a childcare for the people who worked in the co-op. Here is an example of the sewing cooperative. There's also a, a leather smither there on the left. And I love the image, it says, think young, think Andrew Young. Picture of the pig bank. There were 50 pigs that started the pig bank. They fed hundreds and hundreds of families. A uh, really crazy part of how synchronicity works, there's an organization in Madison that was known as um, Measure for Measure. It was a group of really radical progressive whites who um, were uh, academics and clergy, and their goal was to raise money, and they just said, here, we'll send it to Mississippi, and you all use it for what you need it for. There was a real symb symbiotic relationship and was able to meet actually folks who met Mrs. Hamer in Madison when she was there. So it was just really kind of beautiful. And so the folks from Measure for Measure and several other organizations donated to Freedom Farm and other uh, other co-ops in the area. This is a shared t tractor. Why do we all need one tractor? We don't need one tractor. If we put our money together, we can, 
I'll get a better tractor and then share the, you know, share the dog on tractor. So this is one example. They had a farm manager. They had, you know, all kinds of shared resources. And so encouraging this collective and cooperative strategy. Um, here, um, the blueprint for 100 acres of low income and high quality housing. And so what they did was they took the folks who were trained as sharecroppers and tenant farmers, retrained them to actually build houses and to retrofit and to do all kinds of environmentally sound activities. Uh, one example of what the house looked like before. On a, on a tenant farming relationship, and here are the houses that Fannie built. Can't also, in, a, in the book, I do um, talk a bit about the Mount Bayou, Mississippi um, uh, uh, co-op, farmers cooperative. It was an all-black town immediately uh, that started immediately after the Civil War by Isaiah Montgomery and Charles Banks. One was formerly enslaved, the other one was an accomplished business person. And even early it was known as a black, uh, mecca for black folks. This is in the 1800s. Um, it was recognized as the, the largest, most prosperous all-black community in the South. And so this then turned into uh, the National Black, I'm sorry, North Bolivar um, Farmers Cooperative. Um, and here we have John Hatch, who's actually in the co-op field. Here are members of the Delta um, Health Center, the co-op. Uh, they're in the truck filled with the cooperative green beans. Now it's important to think about how did these organizations function. Many of these co-ops were what they call moon farmers. And so we had an agreement, especially like SWAFCA, the Southwest Alabama Farmers Cooperative. There were moon farmers and they had a thousand, they have over a thousand families that were organizing in the Alabama Black Belt. And this is before internet, no Facebook, no, right, no social media. But they were able to agree that we're all going to plant according to the moon, which meant we would plant together, we would water together, we would fertilize together, and then that would maximize the harvest. So no matter where you were, you had an agreement. So I'm looking for the scholarship to support this idea of moon farmers because we have a lot of conversations about it, but I just don't see it represented in the media. And we do know that one of the most um, oppressive or potentially exploitive relationships is when it comes to grading and weighing for the crops. And so many of the co-ops have their own weighing and grading entities with whom they were able um, um, to, to make sure that they got the best, um, the best retail, the best uh, for their income. So the book really just sort of talks about the different ways that farmers contribute to a way of connecting land, food, and freedom. But I also think what's important is to look and to think about the ways, once we're able to feed ourselves, what are some of the other activities that are connected to food? So what we tend to see is we tend to see all of us sort of fighting different Video, uh, different arguments um, with the same enemy, so to speak, right? And so the food folks end up fighting and the education folks are fighting separately from the, right? And so it's all these different sort of, but I argue that they're really all the same. Um, and so if there's a way for us to think about how do we organize and unite these struggles for clean food, um, healthy, clean, oh, sorry, healthy food, clean water, safe neighborhoods, quality education, community policing, I think that that really allows us to unite ourselves in really powerful ways. So the discussion from Food isn't disconnected from land, is not disconnected from education, not disconnected from employment, safety, security, transportation, housing, and health care. And so these are the components, I think, of resilient cities that our freedom farmers can actually bring forth. Some of the future projects that we have going on, um, we received an AFRI grant that ended last year, and so we have some work coming from there. We interviewed, we did focus groups with over 200 farmers in Michigan. Sorry, Illinois. Sorry. Next time. Uh, and so um, I was responsible for the Black and Latinx uh, community of farmers in um, West Michigan. And so we're coming up with those, writing those articles, those uh, data up in articles. I have been working on a Paris family biography. The elder Paris was the first black USDA loan officer. They say Alabama, I say the country, because Alabama is the first for so much. But I have to make that, that case. And so, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the father and the two sons have been active and involved in uh, organizing for the last 75 years for sure, and their story is rich and beautiful and needs to be told. Um, I do have a journal, a quarterly column with the Journal of Ag uh, Agriculture, Food Systems, and Community Development. Um, another project that I'm interested in, I'm super excited, is looking at the role of black anglers, fishermen and women, and the connection between fishing and self-provisioning. But as African Americans, fishing has always been important to us, and I just don't see the scholarship to, vid to describe how beautiful that is. And then I'm interested in working with the Burkettes on a family biography. And that is it. I hope you have some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you're
you're already doing it, just know that there's historical precedent for what you're doing. And um, yeah, let's keep building. I have been told we have time for two questions. Just two? Did I go that long? That's no fear. Um, I'm a big fan, big, big Thank fan. Thank you. Um, so my question is, understanding that cooperatives have been around, right? right? Yeah. How, what do you think is the reason that they've been so quiet kept as a pragmatic yeah. approach to resistance for communities of color? So here's my long and the short of it. it the, the long and the short of it is I think that I, I agree with Chimananda Adichie, which is that we suffer from the story, the single story, right? And so once you get a hold of a story, you're like, okay, that's it. I don't need any additional information. And so if the narrative of African Americans and agriculture is one of sharecropping, tenant farming, and slavery, why would you want to do that? If you're talking about connecting land, food, and freedom, well, then sign me up, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that as a strategy, even looking at the way that cooperatives have been described differently in the media. So when I was doing some of the archival work, they were like, hey, this cooperative just made $4 million, and they were all white. And then it was a black cooperative, and they were like, oh, no, this nationalist, we have to stop them. It's a the threat to our democracy. You're like, wait, is it not the same thing? Okay, well, there's something more here. <clears throat> so I think that as a strategy, an economic strategy, a social political strategy, it's something that has not received its due because it's so powerful. And if there's something that is so power, if there's something that's missing, we have to recognize why is that not a part of our story? I think Jessica Nimhart does an incredible story, a job of telling us the history of the economic necessity and you know, why co-ops are important. And I try to do it from a political and an agricultural um, collective kind of uh, approach. So thank you for that question. Yeah. Other Another questions? Question. Somebody else. Okay. In the absence of hands, I just wanted to ask my graphic novel question. But um, so I know that um, in terms of working with, uh, here we've organized the Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group, uh, specifically thinking through some of these cooperative okay. strategies, touching upon Dr. Nimbar's text. Um, but I, I know that once we got through it, you know, one of the things we did was we developed a zine because we wanted to kind of have a more accessible right. means. And I know that Dr. Nimbard has talked That's about right. shifting towards a graphic novel format right. for right. collective courage yeah. and augmenting. So um, anything like that happening with the Freedom Farmers? Sure. You know, so other media, Dr. Media? Nimhart and I are in conversation. We want to take this on the road. <laughs> so we're thinking about what does this look like? I want to do a curriculum. I want to do a children's book. I want to do cartoons. Like I, I want to do it all. I want to do a documentary. I just feel like the story of black farmers has been um, muted, and I just want to crank up the volume a little bit in a variety of different ways, not just in terms of writing the book. And so the answer to your question is yes. Thank you.